536, chapters 34, 35, 36, and 37 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Book talk starts at 1505. Welcome to Craplet, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 536, Better Now. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I have recently seen a very interesting documentary that I wanted to share with you. It's called The Social Dilemma. I believe it is on Netflix. And I actually think it came out a while ago, uh, earlier this year. But you know, there have been some other stories in the news that may have taken precedence. However, if you recall back ooh, three and a half years ago, I went to Germany the day after the most recent presidential inauguration. And my friend Meg and I noticed after that that we had both seen completely different stories. And not just stories, but especially photographs, importantly, photographs of the Women's March that occurred shortly thereafter. And it wasn't just the difference in stories. It was the polar oppositeness of the stories that we both found rather striking and also more than a little disturbing because neither of us seem to have gotten an entire story. We both had our suspicions about how that happened at the time. And we've every so often checked in to say, okay, how has this story been portrayed on your feed? And how has it been portrayed on mine? For the last <clears throat> three years, I have, as many of you will have noticed, tried very hard to stay off of social media in general. I will occasionally post things. I will, every once in a while, usually on like Sunday morning, skim through Instagram and like things. I will occasionally get onto Facebook only to go to the Craftlet Annotated Audiobooks group. And I'm not joking, that is the only place I go. Except now I did find a Today in Virology <laughs> group <laughs> on Facebook that I really like quite a lot because uh, they have perspective and information. So, for example, is the virus mutating? No, no, it's not. And if you saw the Washington Post article on how the virus is mutating, you need to pay very close attention to the top line, which is, this is not a peer-reviewed article. <laughs> if it's not peer-reviewed, please, 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 please pay no attention. And if it is peer-reviewed, check the number of people who were involved in the study. Because if it's three people, it just doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> rant over. So you are really the only people who I communicate with on social media. Now I know why. And if you watch The Social Dilemma, please trust me, it's important to watch not just all of it, but it's really, really, really important to watch the credits. Because that's when you see the people who are being interviewed at their most casual. And they are, they are funny. They are light. What they have to say when they're just being them and not being, you know, serious person in front of camera, it's enlightening. The situation is not hopeless, but it does require a certain amount of framing that we have lost touch with. And I will give it to you this way, because this, this problem is affecting the entire world, not just America, but I will give you a, a frame that resonates within the United States. Since I was a teenager, I have heard in the media and from politicians that regulations are bad. Regulations restrict things. And we in America, we don't like restrictions because that infringes on not so much our rights, but it infringes on us getting to do what we want to do right now. And we don't like being told what to do or at least several generations of us don't like being told what to do. The framing that I'm 
recommending keeping in the back of your mind as you watch The Social Dilemma is not so much regulations restrict, but that protections protect. The labor union movement started because poorer people who were working in dangerous conditions, like we know about because we've read a lot of Victorian literature here together, people without any kind of financial or political power behind them, the only power they have is in numbers. And the only way they can protect how they are treated is if they collectively work together to protect themselves. If they present a unified front, it is much more difficult for people with money and power to ignore them. When a lot of people notice that there is a problem, like, for example, the Hudson River is toxic and the fish are glowing and have three eyes, when a lot of people come together, they are able to fight against and get the government to create protections from bad behavior from large corporations. The Hudson River was able to be cleaned up. They've had to do it in some interesting ways that didn't make sense in the beginning, but sure makes sense now. And as a consequence, you can now see people swimming, although I wouldn't, in the Hudson River. It's very cold. And that transformation happened in my lifetime. We had protections enacted in the 90s because, quite famously at the time, there was a hole in the ozone layer that was growing over Antarctica. It's very dangerous. The ozone layer is one of those things that protects not just us, human people, but also the planet from burning up like a nice little charcoal briquette. So protecting the ozone layer turned out to be kind of important. As a consequence, chlorofluorocarbons were banned all over the world. Aquanet hairspray had to find some other means of of propellant for the product that it had in its cans. Or, you know, just deal with using a pump action sprayer. Work just as well. Lo and behold, not actually that long after, the hole in the ozone layer had repaired itself because we took the stuff that was destroying it out of the atmosphere. Wow. Protections or restrictions or regulations, all the same thing, really worked. The list of movements like this, as you know, goes on and on and on. Seatbelts being one of the more famous recent ones. The protests against seatbelts when I was a child were extraordinary. And for for you youngsters who are just growing up and finding out about these things, perhaps you didn't know that when cars were around when I was a young and we didn't have seatbelts. In fact, my mom has told me she remembers, I believe it was in her Plymouth that had a, a front bench seat and a back bench seat. They had a car bed for me as a baby which was just a a bassinet that you could put in the car and drove around with me as a baby in the car bed because I was sleeping. And this made perfect sense. And there was no seat belt. There There was no belt in the car bed. There was just a baby in a blanket and a really responsible mom who was driving me around in a tank. I mean, admittedly, the Plymouth was giant and blue. It was very pretty baby blue. But, uh... It's horrifying now, right, to think that. Like a baby not strapped in, in a moving vehicle, in a moving ton of metal, without an airbag even? Holy cow, how did we ever survive? Well, it's impressive. And honestly, the truth is we didn't all survive because my grandmother on my father's side was killed in a car accident when a drunk driver drove over the top of her car. No seatbelts, no airbags. So... All of this comes to a head when you're watching The Social Dilemma, which is fascinating and funny. And if you watch it with teenagers, and I highly recommend you do, please warn them in advance. Of course, adults made this. And so, of course, they will make it look like teenagers are the only ones with a social media problem. We know this isn't true. However, You have to remember who is the target audience for this documentary. Largely adults. If you don't want the adults to tune you out, you have to make someone who is not an adult, someone who doesn't look like them, you have to make them the scapegoat. So going into it knowing that, you can be preemptively annoyed 
by it instead of actively annoyed during the show. You can just roll your eyes and say, yeah, 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 I knew that was coming. It's true. Although I will say that in these semi-goofy, it starts off goofy, it gets less goofy as it goes along, reenactments of a quote-unquote normal family, and nobody comes out looking great, including the adults. But that's beside the point. Because what it truly comes down to is the need for the word is used constantly in social dilemma, the need for regulation, that the, the internet is an unregulated place, and it's not the internet that is the problem. It is social media platforms, which, and we've heard this said many times in the last four years, if you're getting something for free, it's not that it's free, it's that you are the commodity. The way our data is being mined I know you've heard people talk about it, and it is scary. It's not just scary. And it's not just that data is being mined. It's what's happening to the data after that is so chilling. And they do a beautiful job of explaining some really complicated things during the presentation. It is something that Andrew made us watch on a Friday night. And I thought, really? This is what we're going to watch? I have no interest in watching this. And I was sucked in within six minutes. So I was not just a reluctant viewer. I was a resistant viewer myself and really clearly liked it. And like I said, at the end, I think they they knew under the current circumstances that having a, a real Debbie Downer ending would be bad. And of course, the ending is sobering and serious. But that's why I highly recommend sticking around to watch the guys just being guys after, and the women just being women after, because there's both. Anyway, that was a very long advertisement for one, <laughs> one documentary, but it's an important one. And it's especially important as we head into election season here in the United States. I will once again be working the polls here in New Hope, Pennsylvania. I know Regina is working four days of polls in California. We were comparing notes at the Craftlet Zoom chat, which is still going. Uh, If you have the link, it still works. We've actually gone through 20 weeks of morning and evening chats, as far as East Coast time goes, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. They will continue until there's just no way to do it anymore. But so far, uh, except for a couple of little glitches, where there was a holiday on Monday, and therefore I forgot it was Tuesday and didn't didn't get up. in time. That's been glitchy. And Thursdays at work lately have been exploding. And so Tracy, my local heroine, has stepped in to help out with running the Zooms. And that has been an enormous, enormous help. But yeah, we'll just keep them going as long as we can. It's always great to see everybody. And that's how I found out that Regina was going to be working the polls in California. And we wound up getting a chance to compare notes on how mail-in ballots are working. And I was correct. The really cool thing that Pennsylvania is doing, at least in some jurisdictions, we have super special scanners. They're very restricted. You know how normally on a scanner or a a flatbed printer, you can kind of widen the paper tray a tiny little bit if you need to, or shrink it down a tiny little bit if you need to. Yeah, you can't do that on these scanners. They accept one size of paper. It's very specific special paper. It has barcodes, QR codes, number codes, And special scanner codes that run down the uh, vertical edges of the paper. So there's a whole mess load of different ways that it validates itself. It's kind of like a digital watermark. It's actually, it's a series of several digital watermarks and all of them have to match up within the algorithm that the scanners are running. So there's that protection, but there's even a cooler one, which is the thickness of the paper. For those of you who are spinners, and I know I said this before, the micron count of the paper is very specific and very much not published. It is neither regular printer paper, nor is it cardstock. It is somewhere right in between there. And if you try and insert a regular sheet of paper, it spits it out. If you try to insert a piece of cardstock, even if you cut it down to being the right width, it will spit it out. The scanner will spit it right back out too. The scanners are smarter than people and can identify a fake ballot a mile away. There is no way you could print out a ballot at home and stuff a ballot box. 
And if both Big California and Little Pennsylvania can figure this out, then I am willing to bet that lots of other states have put similar protections in place to verify the sanctity of our voting in the United States. Paper. Funny that. The way we voted for hundreds of years now being vilified. Oi. Okay, soapbox over. Here we go. Today, I have four chapters for you. Super, super interesting chapters. We've had poor Helen going through, dear Lord, the poor woman has just been through enough, right? Well, today, we get to see a little spark of the Helen who we met at the beginning of the book. And what I mean by that is we get to see Anne Bronte position Helen as the midpoint, perhaps a little bit closer to one side than another, but a midpoint between Jane Eyre, oh, I love Rochester, but that's so wrong, but I love him, but he's being a clunk and I don't know what to do. And then she goes off and then Sinjin does a number on her. And now she's traumatized because does God want her to go or not? There's that whole thing. And then on the other end, Emily, so that was Charlotte Bronte. Now we have Emily Bronte in Wuthering Heights. We have Catherine just being a raving witch with a capital B for much of the book. Those are pretty much the opposite ends of the spectrum as far as female characters at the time could go. Helen is interesting. We've seen Helen being put upon, downtrodden, badly treated. We have seen her fight back in several different ways, specific ways. A lot of her fighting back is connected to her understanding of the Bible and her relationship with God which mirrors Anne Bronte quite well. But we're going to get to see her have a little snark in her this week. In, in chapter 34, she comments on a surge of feeling that she gets at one point. And the way she describes it, we will talk about when the chapters are done, because I think it is. It's a beautiful phrase and a very accurate one that went right whizzing right by my head several times until I listened to it again this week. There are a dumpster load of biblical, if not actual, quotations. And I did read something recently that Anne Bronte's quote-unquote quotations from the Bible are often a little tweaky. So if you know your King James quite well, you might say, well, yeah, I know, I know that-ish, but that's not actually the way it's written in the King James Bible. And you're right. She probably never went back and looked up anything. She knew her Bible and the important verses by heart, as did all of the Bronte children, being the children of Patrick Bronte, who was the clergyman for Haworth. And of course, because they were all really crazy smart. So memorizing stuff like the King James Bible would have been no sweat. But there's one moment in particular that I want you to listen for. If you remember the story of Jesus, there's a woman who had been, quote unquote, taken in adultery, and everybody's willing to stone her. And Jesus does the, those of you without sin, cast the first stone, which of course makes everybody go, oh! and decide not to stone her, and they wander away. He lifts her up and says, the poor accused of adultery woman, and says, go and sin no more. Listen for how Helen uses that statement in chapter 35, our second chapter. It's marvelous and, and honestly, kind of ballsy for Anne Bronte to have done. So it's another reason I'm kind of impressed with her. Also in chapter 36, our third chapter today, you will hear a lot of Helen describing what it feels like to have been living in an untenable situation for quite a few years now and what it does to one emotionally. And I think she she does a Anne Bronte does a lovely job of talking talking about the she doesn't say it this way but the amount of of armor that you have to wear to protect yourself emotionally in order to survive it. And then in chapter 37 our fourth chapter for today one of the characters mentions revenge to Helen. 
pay very close attention to her response. Because I think that line is the key to both her and to Anne Bronte. And I, I would cross stitch this sucker and hang it on the wall. I think it's so important. If you have read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, you will hear a whole mess load of Pilgrim's Progress references all the way through our fourth chapter, chapter 37. And in fact, the last line of chapter 37 is a mirror of Christian's last line after the battle in Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read it, you won't miss anything. I know when we did Little Women, there were several listeners who went and read Pilgrim's Progress because it played such a central role in Louisa May Alcott's book as well. Chapter 37 brings us to the end of Volume 2, which seems to be a perfect place to end for today. Originally, I was just going to do three chapters because it will be long, but when I saw that 37 was the end and, uh, and that I had to skip last week, I thought I'd just let you go all the way to the end of the volume, which means we're two-thirds of the way through the book, and fairly soon we will wind up with Gilbert coming to the end of Helen's journal. Remember, we are actually reading along with Gilbert right now. This is Helen's journal, not action, that was taking place in the first third of the book. So, with that said, here we go, listening to chapters 34, 35, 36, and 37 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, read for us by Mia Degeer. Here we go. Chapter 34. Concealment. Evening. Breakfast passed well over. I was calm and cool throughout. I answered composedly all inquiries respecting my health, and whatever was unusual in my look or manner was generally attributed to the trifling indisposition that had occasioned my early retirement last night. But how am I to get over the ten or twelve days that must yet elapse before they go? Yet why so long for their departure? When they are gone, how shall I get through the months or years of my future life in company with that man, my greatest enemy, for none could injure me as he has done? Oh, when I think how fondly, how foolishly I've loved him, how madly I've trusted him, how constantly I've laboured and studied and prayed and struggled for his advantage, and how cruelly he's trampled on my love, betrayed my trust and scorned my prayers and tears and efforts for his preservation, crushed my hopes destroyed my youth's best feelings and doomed me to a life of hopeless misery as far as a man can do it. It's not enough to say that I no longer love my husband. I hate him. The word stares me in the face like a guilty confession, but it is true. I hate him. I hate him. But God have mercy on his miserable soul and make him see and feel his guilt. I ask no other vengeance. If he could but fully know and truly feel my wrongs, I should be well avenged, for I could freely pardon all. But he is so lost, so hardened in his heartless depravity, that in this life I believe he never will. But it's useless dwelling on this theme. Let me seek once more to dissipate reflection in the minor details of passing events. Mr Hargrave has annoyed me all day long with his serious sympathising and, as he thinks, unobtrusive politeness. If it were more obtrusive, it would trouble me less, for then I could snub him. But as it is, he contrives to appear so really kind and thoughtful that I cannot do so without rudeness and seeming ingratitude. I sometimes think I ought to give him credit for the good feeling he simulates so well. And then again, I think it's my duty to suspect him under the peculiar circumstance in which I am placed. His kindness may not all be feigned, but still let not the purest impulse of gratitude to him induce me to forget myself. Let me remember the game of chess, the expressions he used on the occasion, those indescribable looks of his that so justly roused my indignation, and I think I shall be safe enough. I have done well to record them so minutely. I think he wishes to find an opportunity of speaking to me alone. He has seemed to be on the watch all day, but I have taken care to disappoint him. Not that I fear anything he could say, but I have trouble enough without the addition of his insulting consolations, condolences, or whatever else he might attempt. 
and for Millicent's sake I do not wish to quarrel with him. He excused himself for going out to shoot with the other gentlemen in the morning, under the pretext of having letters to write, and instead of retiring for that purpose into the library, he sent for his desk into the morning room, where I was seated with Millicent and Lady Lowborough. They had betaken themselves to their work. I, less to divert my mind than to deprecate conversation, had provided myself with a book. Millicent saw that I wished to be quiet and accordingly let me alone. Annabella doubtless saw it too, but that was no reason why she should restrain her tongue or curb her cheerful spirits. She accordingly chatted away, addressing herself almost exclusively to me, and with the utmost assurance and familiarity growing the more animated and friendly, the colder and briefer my answers became. Mr Hargrave saw that I could ill endure it, and looking up from his desk he answered her questions and observations for me as far as he could, and attempted to transfer her social attentions from me to himself. But it would not do. Perhaps she thought I had a headache and could not bear to talk. At any rate, she saw that her loquacious vivacity annoyed me, as I could tell by the malicious pertinacity with which she persisted. But I checked it, effectually by putting into her hand the book I had been trying to read, on the flyer-leaf of which I had hastily scribbled, I am too well acquainted with your character and conduct to feel any real friendship for you, and as I am without your talent for dissimulation, I cannot assume the appearance of it. I must therefore beg that hereafter all familiar intercourse may cease between us, and if I still continue to treat you with civility, as if you were a woman worthy of consideration and respect, understand that it is out of regard for your cousin Millicent's feelings, not for yours. Upon perusing this, she turned scarlet and bit her lip. Covertly tearing away the leaf, she crumpled it up and put it in the fire, and then employed herself in turning over the pages of the book, and really or apparently perusing its contents. In a little while, Millicent announced it her intention to repair to the nursery, and asked if I would accompany her. "'Annabella will excuse us,' she said. "'She is busy reading.' "'No, I won't.' cried Annabella, suddenly looking up and throwing her book onto the table. I want to speak to Helen a minute. You may go, Millicent, and she'll follow you in a while. Millicent went. Will you oblige me, Helen? continued she. Her impudence astounded me, but I complied and followed her into the library. She closed the door and walked up to the fire. Who told you this? said she. No one. I am not incapable of seeing for myself. Ah, you're suspicious, cried she, smiling with a gleam of hope. Hitherto there had been a kind of desperation in her hardihood. Now she was evidently relieved. If I were suspicious, I replied, I should have discovered your infamy long before. No, Lady Lowborough, I do not found my charge upon suspicion. And what do you found it, then? said she, throwing herself into an armchair stretching out her feet to the fender with an obvious effect to appear composed. I enjoy a moonlight ramble as well as you, I answered, steadily fixing my eyes upon her, and the shrubbery happens to be one of my favourite resorts. She coloured again, excessively, and remained silent, pressing her finger against her teeth and gazing into the fire. I watched her a few moments with a feeling of malevolent gratification, then moving towards the door, I calmly asked if she had anything more to say. Yes, yes, cried she eagerly, starting up from her reclining posture. I want to know if you will tell Lord Lowborough. Suppose I do. Well, if you're disposed to publish the matter, I cannot dissuade you, of course. But there'll be terrible work if you do. And if you don't, I shall think you the most generous of mortal beings. And if there's anything in the world I can do for you, anything short of... She hesitated. "'Short of renouncing your guilty connection with my husband, I suppose you mean,' said I. She paused, in evident disconcertation and perplexity, mingled with anger she dared not show. "'I cannot renounce what is dearer than life,' she muttered in a low, hurried tone. Then, suddenly raising her head and fixing her gleaming eyes upon me, she continued earnestly. "'But Helen, or Mrs Huntington, who, whatever you would have me call you, "'Will you tell him? If you are generous, here is a fitting opportunity for the exercise of your magnanimity. "'If you're proud, here I am, 
your rival, ready to acknowledge myself your debtor for an act of most noble forbearance. I shall not tell him. You will not, cried she delightedly. Accept my sincere thanks then. She sprang up and offered me her hand. I drew back. Give me no thanks. It is not for your sake that I refrain. Neither it is an act of forbearance. I have no wish to publish your shame. I should be sorry to distress your husband with the knowledge of it. And Millicent, will you tell her? No. On the contrary, I shall do my utmost to conceal it from her. I would not for much that she would know the infamy and disgrace of her relation. You use hard words, Mrs. Huntington, but I can pardon you. And now, Lady Lowborough, continued I, let me counsel you to leave this house as soon as possible. You must be aware that your continuance here is excessively disagreeable to me, not for Mr. Huntington's sake, said I, observing the dawn of a malicious smile of triumph on her face. You're welcome to him if you like him, as far as I'm concerned, but because it's painful to be always disguising my true sentiments respecting you and straining to keep up an appearance of civility and respect towards one for whom I have not the most distant shadow of esteem. And, because if you stay, your conduct cannot possibly remain concealed much longer from the only two persons in the house who do not know it already. And for your husband's sake, Annabella, and even your own, I wish, I earnestly advise and entreat you to break off this unlawful connection at once, and return to your duty while you may, before the dreadful consequences. Yes, yes, of course, said she, interrupting me with a gesture of impatience. But I cannot go, Helen, before the time appointed for our departure. What possible pretext could I frame for such a thing? Whether I proposed going back alone, which Lowborough would not hear of, or taking him with me, the very circumstance itself will be certain to excite suspicion. And when our visit is so nearly at the end, too, little more than a week, surely you can endure my presence so long. I will not annoy you with any more of my friendly impertinences. Well, I have nothing more to say to you. Have you mentioned this affair to Huntington? asked she as I was leaving the room. How dare you mention his name to me? was the only answer I gave. No words have passed between us since, but such as outward decency or pure necessity demanded. Chapter 35 Provocations 19th in proportion, as Lady Lowborough finds she has nothing to fear from me, and as the time of departure draws nigh, the more audacious and insolent she becomes. She does not scruple to speak to my husband with affectionate familiarity in my presence when no one else is by, and is particularly fond of displaying her interest in his health and welfare or in anything that concerns him, as if for the purpose of contrasting her kind solicitude with my cold indifference and he rewards her by such smiles and glances, such whispered words or boldly spoken insinuations, indicative of his sense of her goodness and my neglect, as makes the blood rush to my face in spite of myself, for I would be utterly regardless of it all, deaf and blind to everything that passes between them, since the more I show myself sensible of their wickedness, the more she triumphs in her victory, and the more he flatters himself that I love him devotedly still, in spite of my pretending indifference. On such occasions I have sometimes been startled by a subtle fiendish suggestion inciting me to show him the contrary by a seeming encouragement of Hargrave's advances. But such ideas are banished in a moment with horror and self-abasement and then I hate him tenfold more than ever for having brought me to this. God pardon me for it and all my sinful thoughts. Instead of being humbled and purified by my afflictions I feel they're turning my nature into gall. This must be my fault as much as theirs that wrong me. No true Christian could cherish such bitter feelings as I do against him and her, especially the latter. Him I still feel that I could pardon, freely, gladly, on the slightest token of repentance. But she, words cannot utter my abhorrence. Reason forbids, but passion urges strongly, and I must pray and struggle long ere I subdue it. It is well that she is leaving tomorrow, for I could not well endure her presence for another day. This morning she rose earlier than usual. I found her in the room alone when I went down to breakfast. Oh, Helen, is it you? She said, turning as I entered. 
I gave an involuntary start back on seeing her, at which she uttered a short laugh, observing, I think we're both disappointed. I came forward and busied myself with the breakfast things. This is the last day I shall burden your hospitality, said she as she seated herself at the table. Ah, here comes one that will not rejoice at it, she murmured, half to herself as Arthur entered the room. He shook hands with her and wished her a good morning, and then, looking lovingly in her face and still retaining her hand in his, murmured pathetically, The last, last day. Yes, she said with some asperity, and I rose early to make the best of it, and I've been here alone this half hour, and you, you lazy creature. Well, I thought I was early too, said he, but, dropping his voice almost to a whisper, you see, we are not alone. We never are, returned she. But they were almost as good as alone, for I was now standing at the window, watching the clouds, struggling to suppress my wrath. Some more words passed between them, which happily I did not overhear, but Annabella had the audacity to come and place herself beside me, and even to put her hand upon my shoulder, and say softly, You need not grudge him to me, Helen, for I love him more than ever you could do. This put me beside myself. I took her hand and violently dashed it from me, with an expression of abhorrence and indignation that could not be suppressed. Startled, almost appalled by this sudden outbreak, she recoiled in silence. I would have given way to my fury and said more, but Arthur's low laugh recalled me to myself. I checked the half-uttered invective and scornfully turned away, regretting that I'd given him so much amusement. He was still laughing when Mr Hargrave made his appearance. How much of the scene he had witnessed I do not know, for the door was ajar when he entered. He greeted his host and his cousin both coldly, and me with a glance intended to express the deepest sympathy, mingled with high admiration and esteem. "'How much allegiance do you owe to that man?' he asked below his breath as he stood beside me at the window, affecting to be making observations on the weather. "'None,' I answered, and immediately returning to the table I employed myself in making the tea.' He followed, and would have entered into some kind of conversation with me, but the other guests were now beginning to assemble, and I took no more notice of him except to give him his coffee. After breakfast, determined to pass as little of the day as possible in company with Lady Lowborough, I quickly stole away from the company and retired to the library. Mr Hargrave followed me thither under the pretence of coming for a book, and first, turning to the shelves, he selected a volume, and then... Quietly, but by no means timidly, approaching me, he stood beside me, resting his hand on the back of my chair, and said softly, "'And so do you consider yourself free at last?' "'Yes,' said I, without moving or raising my eyes from my book, "'free to do anything but offend God and my conscience.' There was a momentary pause. "'Very right,' said he. Providing your conscience be not too morbidly tender and your ideas of God not too erroneously severe, but can you suppose it would offend that benevolent being to make the happiness of one who would die for yours, to raise a devoted heart from purgatorial torments to a state of heavenly bliss when you could do it without the slightest injury to yourself or any other? This was spoken in a low, earnest, melting tone as he bent over me. I now raised my head, and steadily confronting his gaze, I answered calmly, "'Mr. Hargrave, do you mean to insult me?' He was not prepared for this. He paused a moment to recover the shock. Then, drawing himself up and removing his hand from my chair, he answered with proud sadness, "'That was not my intention.' I just glanced towards the door with a slight movement of the head, and then returned to my book. He immediately withdrew, this was better than if I had answered with more words and in the passionate spirit to which my first impulse would have prompted. What a good thing it is to be able to command one's temper. I must labour to cultivate this inestimable quality. God only knows how often I shall need it in this rough dark road that lies before me. In the course of the morning I drove over to the grove with the two ladies to give Millicent an opportunity of bidding farewell to her mother and sister. They persuaded her to stay with them for the rest of the day, Mrs. Hargrave promising to bring her back in the evening and remain till the party broke up on the morrow. Consequently, Lady Lober and I had the pleasure of returning tete-a-tete -tete in the carriage together. For the first mile or two we kept silence, I looking out of my window and she leaning back in her corner. 
but I was not going to restrict myself to a particular position for her. When I was tired of leaning forward with the cold raw wind in my face and surveying the russet hedges and the damp tangled grass of their banks, I gave it up and leant back too. With her usual impudence, my companion then made some attempts to get up a conversation, but the monosyllables yes or no or humph were the utmost her several remarks could elicit from me. At last, on her asking my opinion upon some immaterial point of discussion, I answered, "'Why do you wish to talk to me, Lady Lowborough? "'You must know what I think of you.' "'Well, if you will be so bitter against me,' replied she, "'I can't help it, but I'm not going to sulk for anybody.' Our short drive was now at an end. As soon as the carriage door was open, she sprang out and went down the park to meet the gentlemen who were just returning from the woods. "'Of course I did not follow.' but I had not done with her impudence yet. After dinner I retired to the drawing-room as usual and she accompanied me, but I had the two children with me and I gave them my whole attention and determined to keep them till the gentleman came or till Millicent arrived with her mother. Little Helen, however, was soon tired of playing and insisted upon going to sleep, and while I sat on the sofa with her on my knee and Arthur seated beside me, gently playing with her soft flaxen hair, Lady Lobra composedly came and placed herself on the other side. "'Tomorrow, Mrs. Huntington,' said she, "'you will be delivered from my presence, which no doubt you will be very glad of. It's natural you should. But do you know I have rendered you a great service? Shall I tell you what it is?' "'I shall be glad to hear of any service you've rendered me,' said I, determined to be calm, for I knew by the tone of her voice she wanted to provoke me. "'Well,' resumed she, "'Have you not observed this salutary change in Mr. Huntington? "'Don't you see what a sober, temperate man he has become? "'You saw with regret the sad habits he was contracting. "'I know. "'And I know that you did your utmost to deliver him from them, "'but without success, until I came to your assistance. "'I told him in a few words that I could not bear to see him degrade himself so, "'and that I should cease to... "'No matter what I told him, but you see the reformation I have wrought. "'You ought to thank me for it.' I rose and rang for the nurse. "'But I desire no thanks,' she continued. "'All the return I ask is that you will take care of him when I am gone "'and not by harshness and neglect driving back to his old courses.' "'I was almost sick with passion, but Rachel was now at the door. "'I pointed to the children, for I could not trust myself to speak. "'She took them away, and I followed. "'Will you, Helen?' continued the speaker. "'I gave her a look that blighted the malicious smile on her face.' or checked it at least for a moment, and departed. In the anteroom I met Mr. Hargrave. He saw I was in no humour to be spoken to, and suffered me to pass without a word. But when, after a few minutes' seclusion in the library, I had regained my composure, and was returning to join Mrs. Hargrave and Millicent, who I had just heard come downstairs and go into the drawing-room, I found him there, still lingering in the dimly lighted apartment, and evidently waiting for me. "'Mrs. Huntingdon,' said he as I passed, "'Will you allow me one word?' "'What is it, then? Be quick, if you please. "'I offended you this morning, and I cannot live under your displeasure. "'Then go and sin no more,' replied I, turning away. "'No, no,' said he hastily, setting himself before me. "'Pardon me, but I must have your forgiveness. "'I leave you tomorrow, and I may not have an opportunity of speaking to you again. "'I was wrong to forget myself and, and you as I did.' But let me implore you to forget and forgive my rash presumption and, and think of me as if those words had never been spoken. For believe me, I regret them deeply, and the loss of your esteem is too severe a penalty. I cannot bear it. Forgetfulness is not to be purchased with a wish, and I cannot bestow my esteem on all who desire it, unless they deserve it too. But I shall think my life well spent in labouring to deserve it, if you will but pardon this offence. Will you... Yes. Yes, but that's coldly spoken. Give me your hand and I'll believe you. You won't? Then, Mrs. Huntington, you do not forgive me. Yes, here it is, and my forgiveness with it. Only sin no more. He pressed my cold hand with a sentimental fervour, but said nothing and stood aside to let me pass into the room where all the company were now assembled. Mr. Grimsby was seated near the door, on seeing me enter, almost immediately followed by Hargrave, he leered at me with a glance of intolerable significance as I passed. 
I looked him in the face, till he sullenly turned away, if not ashamed, at least confounded for the moment. Meantime, Hattersley had seized Hargrave by the arm and was whispering something in his ear, some coarse joke, no doubt, for the latter neither laughed nor spoke in answer, but turning from him with a slight curl of the lip, disengaged himself and went to his mother, who was telling Lord Lowborough how many reasons she had to be proud of her son. Thank heaven they're all going tomorrow. Chapter 36 Dual Solitude December 20th, 1824 This is the third anniversary of our felicitous union. It is now two months since our guests left us to the enjoyment of each other's society, and I have had nine weeks' experience of this new phase of conjugal life. Two persons living together as master and mistress of the house and father and mother of a winsome merry little child, with a mutual understanding that there is no love, friendship or sympathy between them. As far as in me lies, I endeavour to live peaceably with him. I treat him with unimpeachable civility, give up my convenience to his, wherever it may reasonably be done, and consult him in a business-like way on household affairs, deferring to his pleasure and judgment, even when I know the latter to be inferior to my own. As for him, for the first week or two he was peevish and low, fretting, I suppose, over his dear Annabella's departure, and particularly ill-tempered to me. Everything I did was wrong. I was cold-hearted, hard, insensate. My sour, pale face was perfectly repulsive. My voice made him shudder. He knew not how he could live through the winter with me. I should kill him by inches. Again I proposed a separation, but it would not do. He was not going to be the talk of all those gossips in the neighbourhood. He would not have it said that he was such a brute his wife could not live with him. No, he must contrive to bear with me. I must contrive to bear with you, you mean, said I, for as long as I discharge my functions of steward and housekeeper so conscientiously and well, without pay and without thanks, you cannot afford to part with me. I shall therefore remit these duties when my bondage becomes intolerable. This threat, I thought, would serve to keep him in check if anything would. I believe he was much disappointed that I did not feel his offensive sayings more acutely, for when he had said anything particularly well calculated to hurt my feelings, he would stare me searchingly in the face and then grumble against my marble heart or my brutal insensibility. If I had wept bitterly and deplored his lost affection, he would perhaps have condescended to pity me and take me into favour for a while, just to comfort his solitude and console him for the absence of his beloved Annabella until he could meet her again, or some more fitting substitute. Thank heaven I am not so weak as that. I was infatuated once, with a foolish besotted affection that clung to him, in spite of his unworthiness, but it is fairly gone now, wholly crushed and withered away, and he has none but himself and his vices to thank for it. At first, in compliance with his sweet lady's injunctions, I suppose, he abstained wonderfully well from seeking to solace his cares in wine, but at length he began to relax his virtuous efforts, and now and then exceeded a little, and still continues to do so. Nay, sometimes not a little. When he's under the exciting influence of these excesses, he sometimes fires up and attempts to play the brute, and then I take a little pains to suppress my scorn and disgust. When he is under the depressing influence of the after-consequences, he bemoans his suffering and his errors, and charges them both upon me. He knows such indulgence injures his health, and does him more harm than good, but he says I drive him to it by my unnatural and womanly conduct. It will be the ruin of him in the end, but it's all my fault. And then I am roused to defend myself, sometimes with bitter recrimination. This is a kind of injustice I cannot patiently endure. Have I not laboured long and hard to save him from this very vice? Would I not labour still to deliver him from it if I could? But could I do so by fawning on him and caressing him when I know that he scorns me? Is it my fault that I've lost my influence with him, or that he has forfeited every claim to my regard? And should I seek a reconciliation with him when I feel that I abhor him and he despises me? and while he continues to still correspond with Lady Lober, as I know he does. No, never, never, never. He may drink himself dead, but it is not my fault. Yet I do my part to save him still. I give him to understand that drinking makes his eyes dull and his face red and bloated, and that it tends to render him imbecile in body and mind, 
and if Annabella were to see him as often as I do, she would speedily be disenchanted, and that she would certainly withdraw her favour from him if he continues such courses. Such a mode of admonition wins only coarse abuse for me, and indeed I almost feel as if I deserve it, for I hate to use such arguments. But they sink into his stupefied heart and make him pause and ponder and abstain, more than anything else I could say. At present I am enjoying a temporary relief from his presence. He's gone with Hargrave to join a distant hunt and will probably not be back before tomorrow evening. How differently I used to feel his absence. Mr Hargrave is still at the Grove. He and Arthur frequently meet to pursue their rural sports together. He often calls upon us here and Arthur not unfrequently rides over to him. I do not think either of these soi disant friends is overflowing with love for the other, but such intercourse serves to get the time on and I'm very willing it should continue as it saves me some hours of discomfort in Arthur's society and gives him some better employment than the sottish indulgences of his sensual appetites. The only objection I have to Mr Hargrave's being in the neighbourhood is the fear of meeting him at the Grove prevents me from seeing his sister as often as I otherwise should. For of late he has conducted himself with such unerring propriety that I've almost forgotten his former conduct. I suppose he's striving to win my esteem. If he continued to act in this way, he may win it. But what then? The moment he attempts to demand anything more, he will lose it again. February 10th. It is a hard, embittered thing to have one's kind feelings and good intentions cast back in one's teeth. I was beginning to relent towards my wretched partner, to pity his forlorn, comfortless condition, unalleviated as it is by the con consolations of intellectual resources and the answers of a good conscience towards God, and to think I ought to sacrifice my pride and renew my efforts once again to make his home agreeable and lead him back to the path of virtue, not by false professions of love, not by pretend remorse, but by mitigating my habitual coldness of manner and commuting my frigid civility into kindness wherever an opportunity occurred. And not only was I beginning to think so, but I had already begun to act upon the thought. And what was the result? No answering spark of kindness, no awakening penitence, but unappeasable ill-humour and a spirit of tyrannous exaction that increased with indulgence, and a lurking gleam of self-complacent triumph at every detection of relenting softness in my manner that congealed me to marble again as often as it recurred. And this morning he finished the business. I think the petrification is so completely affected at last that nothing can melt me again. Among his letters was one he perused with symptoms of unusual gratification and then threw it across the table to me with the admonition, there, read that and take a lesson by it. It was in the free dashing hand of Lady Lowborough. I glanced at the first page. It seemed full of extravagant protestations of affection, impetuous longings for speedy reunion and impious defiance of God's mandates and railings against his providence for having cast their lot asunder and doomed them both to the hateful bondage of alliance with those they could not love. He gave a slight titter on seeing me change colour. I folded up the letter, rose and returned it to him with no remark, but thank you, I will take a lesson by it. My little Arthur was standing between his knees, delightedly playing with a bright ruby ring on his finger. Urged by a sudden imperative impulse to deliver my son from that contaminating influence, I caught him up in my arms and carried him with me out of the room. Not liking this abrupt removal, the child began to pout and cry. This was a new stab to my already tortured heart. I would not let him go, but taking him with me to the library, I shut the door, and kneeling on the floor beside him, I embraced and kissed him, wept over him with passionate fondness. Rather frightened than consoled by this, he turned, struggling from me, and cried out aloud for his papa. I released him from my arms, and never were more bitter tears than those that now concealed him from my blinded, burning eyes. Hearing his cries, the father came into the room. I instantly turned away, lest he should see and misconstrue my emotion. He swore at me and took the now pacified child away. It is hard that my little darling should love him more than me, and that when the well-being and culture of my son is all I have to live for, I should see my influence destroyed by one whose selfish affection is more injurious than the coldest indifference or the harshest tyranny could be. If I, for his good, deny him some trifling indulgence, he goes to his father, 
and the latter, in spite of his selfish indolence, will even give himself some trouble to meet the child's desires. If I attempt to curb his will, or look gravely upon him for some act of childish disobedience, he knows his other parent will smile on him and take his part against me. Thus not only have I the father's spirit in the son to contend against, germs of his evil tendencies to search out and eradicate, and his corrupting intercourse an example in after life to counteract, but already he counteracts my arduous labour for the child's advantage, destroys my influence over his tender mind, and robs me of his very love. I had no earthly hope but this, and he seems to take a diabolical delight in tearing it away. But it is wrong to despair. I will remember the counsel of the inspired writer to him that feareth the Lord and obeyeth the voice of his servant, that sitteth in darkness and hath no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Chapter 37 The Neighbour Again December 20th, 1825 Another year is past and I am weary of this life. And yet I cannot wish to leave it. Whatever afflictions assail me here, I cannot wish to go and leave my darling in this dark and wicked world alone without a friend to guide him through its weary mazes, to warn him of its thousand snares and guard him from the perils that beset him on every hand. I am not well fitted to be his only companion, I know, but there's no other to supply my place. I am too grave to minister to his amusements and enter into his infantile sports as a nurse or a mother ought to, and often his bursts of gleeful merriment trouble and alarm me. I see in them his father's spirit and temperament, and I tremble for the consequences, and too often damp the innocent mirth I ought to share. That father, on the contrary, has no weight of sadness on his mind, is troubled with no fears, no scruples concerning his son's future welfare, and at evenings especially, the time when the child sees him the most and the oftenest, he is always particularly jocund and open-hearted, ready to laugh and jest with anything or anybody but me, and I am particularly silent and sad. Therefore, of course, the child dotes upon his seeming joyous, amusing, ever-indulgent papa, and will at any time gladly exchange my company for his. This disturbs me greatly, not so much for the sake of my son's affection, though I do prize that highly, and though I feel it is my right, and I know I've done much to earn it, as for that influence over him, which for his own advantage I would strive to purchase and retain, and which for a very spite of his father's delights to rob me of, and from motives of mere idle egotism, is pleased to win to himself, making no use of it but to torment me and ruin the child. My only consolation is that he spends comparatively little of his time at home, and during the months he passes in London or elsewhere, I have a chance of recovering the ground I had lost and overcoming with good the evil that he has wrought by his willful mismanagement. But then it is my bitter trial to behold him on his return, doing his utmost to subvert my labours and transform my innocent, affectionate, tractable darling into a selfish, disobedient and mischievous boy therefore preparing the soil for those vices he has so successfully cultivated in his own perverted nature. Happily, there were none of Arthur's friends invited to Grassdale last autumn. He took himself off to visit some of them instead. I wish he would always do so, and I wish his friends were numerous and loving enough to keep him amongst them all year round. Mr Hargrave, considerably to my annoyance, did not go with him, but I think I've done with that gentleman at last. For seven or eight months he behaved so remarkably well and managed so skilfully too that I was almost completely off my guard and I was really beginning to look upon him as a friend and even treat him as such with certain prudent restrictions which I deemed scarcely necessary when presuming upon my unsuspecting kindness he thought he might venture to overstep the bounds of decent moderation and propriety that has so long retained him. It was on a pleasant evening at the close of May. I was wandering in the park, and he, on seeing me there, as he rode past, made bold to enter and approach me, dismounting and leaving his horse at the gate. This was the first time he had ventured to come within its enclosure since I had been left alone, without the sanction of his mother's or sister's company, or at least the excuse of a message from them. But he managed to appear so calm and easy, so respectful and self-possessed in his friendliness, 
that though a little surprised, I was neither alarmed nor offended at the unusual liberty, and he walked with me under the ash trees and by the waterside, and talked with considerable animation, good taste and intelligence on many subjects, before I began to think about getting rid of him. Then, after a pause, during which we both stood gazing on the calm blue water, I, revolving in my mind the best means of politely dismissing my companion, he no doubt pondering on other matters, equally alien to the sweet sights and sounds that alone were present to his sense, he suddenly electrified me by beginning in a peculiar tone, low, soft, but perfectly distinct, to pour forth the most unequivocal expression of earnest and passionate love, pleading his cause with all the bold yet artful eloquence he could summon to his aid. But I cut short his appeal, and repulsed him so determinately, so decidedly, with such a mixture of scornful indignation, tempered with cool dispassionate sorrow and pity for his benighted mind, that he withdrew, astonished, mortified and discomforted, and a few days after I heard that he had departed for London. He returned, however, in eight or nine weeks, and did not entirely keep aloof from me, but comported himself in so remarkable a manner that his quick-sighted sister could not fail to notice the change. "'What have you done to Walter, Mrs Huntingdon?' she said one morning when I called at the grove, and he had just left the room, after exchanging a few words of the coldest civility. "'He's been so extremely ceremonious and stately of late. I can't imagine what it is about, unless you've desperately offended him.' "'Tell me what it is that I may be your mediator and make you friends again.' "'I have done nothing willfully to offend him,' said I. "'If he is offended, he can best tell you himself what it's about.' "'I'll ask him,' cried the giddy girl, springing up and putting her head out of the window. "'He's only in the garden. Walter!' "'No, no, Esther. You'll seriously displease me if you do, "'and I shall leave you immediately and not come back again for months, perhaps years.' "'Did you call, Esther?' said her brother, approaching the window from without. Yes, I wanted to ask you. Good morning, Esther, said I, taking her hand and giving a severe squeeze. To, to ask you, continued she, to get me a rose for Mrs Huntington. He departed. Mrs Huntington, she exclaimed, turning to me, still holding me fast by the hand. I'm quite shocked at you, and you're just as angry and distant and cold as he is. I'm determined you shall be good as friends as ever before you go. Esther, how can you be so rude? cried Mrs Hargrave, who was seated gravely knitting in her easy chair. Surely you never will learn to conduct yourself like a lady. Well, Mamma, you said yourself. But the young lady was silenced by the uplifted finger of her mamma, accompanied with a very stern shake of the head. Isn't she cross? whispered she to me. But before I could add my share of reproof, Mr. Hargrave reappeared at the window with a beautiful moss rose in his hand. "'Here, Esther, I've brought you the rose,' he said, extending it towards her. "'Give it to her yourself, you blockhead,' cried she, recoiling with a spring from between us. "'Mrs. Huntington would rather receive it from you,' replied he in a very serious tone, but lowering his voice that his mother might not hear. His sister took the rose and gave it to me. "'My brother's compliments, Mrs. Huntington, "'and he hopes you and he will come to a better understanding by and by. "'Will that do, Walter?' added the saucy girl, turning to him, "'putting her arm round his neck as he stood leaning on the sill of the window. "'Or should I have said that you are sorry you were so touchy, "'or that you hope she will pardon your offence? "'You silly girl, you don't know what you're talking about,' replied he gravely. "'Indeed I don't, for I'm quite in the dark.' "'Now, Esther,' interposed Mrs. Hargrave, who, if equally benighted upon the subject of our estrangement, saw at least her daughter was behaving very improperly, "'I must insist upon your leaving the room.' "'Pray don't, Mrs. Hargrave, for I am going to leave it myself,' said I, and immediately made my adieu. About a week after, Mr. Hargrave brought his sister to see me. He conducted himself at first with his usual cold distance, half stately, half melancholy, altogether injured air. But Esther made no remark upon this this time. She had evidently been schooled in better manners. She talked to me, and laughed and romped with little Arthur, her loved and loving playmate. He, somewhat to my discomfort, enticed her from the room to have a run in the hall, and thence into the garden. I got up to stir the fire. Mr. Hargrave asked if I felt cold, and shut the door. 
a very unseasonable piece of officiousness, for I had meditated following the noisy playfellows if they did not speedily return. He then took the liberty of walking up to the fire himself and asking me if I were aware that Mr Huntington was now at the seat of Lord Lowborough and likely to continue there some time. No, but it's no matter, I answered carelessly, and if my cheek glowed like fire it was rather at the question than the information it conveyed. You don't object to it? he said. No, not at all, if Lord Lobra likes his company. You have no love left for him, then? Not the least. I knew that. I knew you were too high-minded and pure in your own nature to continue to regard one so utterly false and polluted with any feelings but that those of indignation, scornful abhorrence. Is he not your friend? said I, turning my eyes from the fire to his face, with perhaps a slight touch of those feelings he assigned to another. He was, replied he with the same calm gravity as before. But do not wrong me by supposing that I could continue my friendship and esteem to a man who could so infamously, so impiously forsake and injure one so transcendental. Well, I won't speak of it. But tell me, do you ever think of revenge? Revenge? No. What good would that do? It would make him no better and me no happier. I don't know how to talk to you, Mrs Huntington, he said, smiling. You are only half a woman. Your nature must be half human, half angelic. Such goodness overawes me. I don't know what to make of it. Then, sir, I fear you must be very much worse than you should be. If I, a mere more ordinary mortal, am by your own confession so vastly your superior, and since there exists so little sympathy between us, I think we'd better each look out for some more congenial companion. And forthwith, moving to the window, I began to look out for my little son, and his gay young friend. No, I am the ordinary mortal, I maintain, replied Mr Hargrave. I will not allow myself to be worse than my fellows, but you, madame, I equally maintain there is nobody like you. But are you happy? he asked in a serious tone. As happy as some others, I suppose. Are you as happy as you desire to be? No one is so blessed as that comes to you on this side of eternity. One thing I know, returned he with a deep and sad sigh, you are immeasurably happier than I am. I'm very sorry for you then, I could not help replying. Are you indeed? No, for if you were, you would be glad to relieve me. And so I should if I could do so without injuring myself or any other. And can you suppose that I should wish you to injure yourself? No, on the contrary, it is your own happiness I long for more than mine. You are miserable now, Mrs Huntington, continued he, looking me boldly in the face. You do not complain, but I see and feel. I know that you are miserable. and must remain so as long as you keep those walls of impenetrable ice about your still warm and palpating heart. And I am miserable too. Deign to smile on me, and I am happy, trust me. And you shall be happy also, for you are a woman, and I can make you so, and I will do it in spite of yourself he muttered between his teeth. And as for others, the question is between ourselves alone. You cannot injure your husband, you know, and no one else has any concern in the manner. I have a son, Mr Hargrave, and you have a mother, said I, retiring from the window whither he had followed me. They need not know, he began, but before any more could be said on either side, Esther and Arthur re-entered the room. The former glanced at Walter's flushed, excited countenance, then at mine, a little flushed and excited too, I dare say, though from far different causes. She must have thought we'd been quarrelling, desperately, and was evidently perplexed and disturbed at the circumstance. But she was too polite, or too much afraid of her brother's anger to refer to it. She seated herself on the sofa and put him back her bright golden ringlets that were scattered in wild profusion over her face. She immediately began to talk about the garden and her little playfellow and continued to chatter away in her usual strain till her brother summoned her to depart. If I've spoken too warmly, forgive me, he murmured on taking his leave, or I shall never forgive myself. Esther smiled and glanced at me. I merely bowed and her countenance fell. She thought it a poor return for Went Walter's generous concession and was disappointed in her friend. Poor child, she little knows the world she lives in. Mr Hargrave had not had an opportunity of meeting me again in private for several weeks after this, 
but when he did meet me, there was less of pride and more of touching melancholy in his manner than before. Oh, how he annoyed me! I was obliged at last almost entirely to remit my visits to the grove, at the expense of deeply offending Mrs. Hargrave and seriously afflicting poor Esther, who rarely values my society for want of better, and who ought not to suffer for the fault of her brother. But that indefatigable foe was not yet vanquished. He seemed to be always on the watch. I frequently saw him riding lingeringly past the premises, looking searchingly round him as he went. Or if I did not, Rachel did. That sharp-sighted woman soon guessed how matters stood between us, and to cry in the enemy's movements from her elevation at the nursery window, she would give me a quiet intimation if she saw me preparing for a walk when she had no reason to believe he was about, or think it was likely that he would meet or overtake me in the way I meant to traverse. I would then defer my ramble, or confine myself for the day to the park and its gardens, or if the proposed excursion was a matter of importance, such as a visit to the sick or afflicted, I would take Rachel with me, and then I was never molested. But one mild sunshiny day, early in November, I had ventured forth alone to visit the village school and a few of the poor tenants, and on my return I was alarmed at the clatter of a horse's feet behind me, approaching at a rapid steady trot. There was no style or gap at hand by which I could escape into the fields, so I walked quietly on, saying to myself, it may not be he after all, and if it is, and if he do annoy me, it shall be for the last time. I am determined, if there be power in words and looks against cold impudence and mawkish sentimentality so inexhaustible as his. The horse soon overtook me. It was reined up close beside me. It was Mr Hargrave. He greeted me with a smile intended to be soft and melancholy but his triumphant satisfaction at having caught me at last so shone through that it was quite a failure. After briefly answering his salutation, inquiring after the ladies at the grove, I turned away and walked on, but he followed and kept his horse at my side. It was evident he intended to be my companion all the way. "'Well, I don't much care. If you want another rebuff, take it and welcome,' was my inward remark. "'Now, sir, what next?' This question, though unspoken, was not long unanswered. After a few passing observations upon indifferent subjects, he began in solemn tones the following appeal to my humanity. It will be four years next April since I first saw you, Mrs Huntington. You may have forgotten the circumstance, but I never can. I admired you then most deeply, but I dared not love you. In the following autumn I saw so much of your perfections that I could not fail to love you, though I dared not show it. For upwards of three years I have endured a perfect martyrdom, from the anguish of suppressed emotions, intense and fruitless longings, silent sorrows, crushed hopes and trampled affections. I have suffered more than I can tell you or imagine, and you were the cause of it, and not altogether the innocent cause. My youth is wasting away, my prospects are darkened, my life is a desolate blank, I have no rest day or night. And become a burden to myself and others, and you might save me by a word and a glance, and will not do it. Is this right? In the first place, I don't believe you, answered I. In the second, if you will be such a fool, I can't hinder it. If you affect, replied he earnestly, to regard as folly the best, the strongest, the most godlike impulses of our nature, I don't believe you. I know you're not the heartless, icy being you pretend to be. You had a heart once, and you gave it to your husband. But when you found him un utterly unworthy of the treasure, you reclaimed it, and you will not pretend that you have loved that sensual, earthly-minded profligate so deeply, so devotedly, that you can never love another. I know there are feelings in your nature that have never been called forth. I know, too, that in your present neglected, lonely state, you are and must be miserable." You have it in your power to raise two human beings from a state of actual suffering to such unspeakable beatitude as only generous, noble, self-forgetting love can give. For you can love me if you will. You may tell me you scorn and detest me, but since you have set me the example of plain speaking, I will answer that I do not believe you. But you will not do it. You choose rather to leave us miserable and you coolly tell me that it is the will of God that we should remain so. You may call this religion, but I call it wild fanaticism. 
There is another life, both for you and me, said I. If it be the will of God that we should sow in tears now, it is only that we may reap in joy hereafter. It is his will that we shall not injure others by the gratification of our own earthly passions. And you have a mother and sisters and friends who would be seriously injured by your disgrace. And I too have friends whose peace of mind should never be sacrificed to my enjoyment or yours either with my consent. And if I were alone in the world, I still have my God and my religion. And I would sooner die than disgrace my calling and break my faith with heaven to obtain a few brief years of false and fleeting happiness. Happiness sure to end in misery, even here, for myself or any other. There need be no disgrace, no misery or sacrifice in any quarter, persisted he. I do not ask you to leave your home or defy the world's opinion. But I need not repeat all his arguments. I refuted them to the best of my power. But that power was provokingly small at the moment, for I was too much flurried with indignation and even shame that he should thus dare to address me to retain sufficient command of thought and language to enable me adequately to contend against his power of sophistries. Finding, however, that he could not be silenced by reason, and even covertly exulted in his seeming advantage and ventured to deride those assertions I had not the coolness to prove, I changed my course and tried another plan. "'Do you really love me?' said I, seriously, pausing and looking him calmly in the face. "'Do I love you?' cried he. Truly, I demanded. His countenance brightened. He thought his triumph was at hand. He commenced a passionate protestation of the truth and further of his attachment, which I cut short by another question. But is it not a selfish love? Have you enough disinterested affection to enable you to sacrifice your own pleasure to mine? I would give my life to serve you. I don't want your life. But have you enough real sympathy for my afflictions to induce you to make an effort to relieve them at the risk of a little discomfort to yourself? Try me and see. If you have, never mention this subject again. You cannot recur to it in any way without doubling the weight of those sufferings you so feelingly deplore. I have nothing left to me but the solace of a good conscience and the hopeful trust in heaven and you labour continually to rob me of these. If you persist, I must regard you as my deadliest foe. But hear me a moment. No, sir. You said you would give your life to serve me. I only ask your silence on one particular point. I have spoken plainly, and what I say I mean. If you torment me in this way any more, I must conclude that your protestations are entirely false, and that you hate me in your heart as fervently as you profess to love me. He bit his lip and bent his eyes upon the ground in silence for a while. Then I must leave you, said he at length, looking steadily upon me as if with the last hope of detecting some token of irrepressible anguish or dismay awakened by these solemn words. I must leave you. I cannot live here and be forever silent, on the all-absorbing subject of my thoughts and wishes. Formerly, I believe, you spent a little of your time at home, I answered. It will do you no harm to absent yourself again for a while, if that be really necessary. If that be really possible, he muttered. And can you bid me go so coolly? You really wish it? Most certainly I do. If you cannot see me without tormenting me as you have lately done, I would gladly say farewell and never see you more. He made no answer, but bending from his horse, held out his hand towards me. I looked up at his face and saw therein such a look of genuine agony of soul that, whether bitter disappointment or wounded pride or lingering love or burning wrath were uppermost, I could not hesitate to put my hand in his as frankly as if I bade a friend farewell. He grasped it very hard and immediately put spurs to his horse and galloped away. Very soon after, I learnt that he was gone to Paris, where he still is, and the longer he stays there, the better for me. I thank God for this deliverance. Right then. 
I thank God for this deliverance. You may, if you are a Hamilton aficionado, remember this line from Hurricane in Act 2. There's a, there's a line similar to uh, I thank God for this deliverance in that song as well. And for the same reason, uh, if not Bunyan and Pilgrim's Progress, at least God, religion, and the Bible. Christian thanks God for his deliverance after he has been wrapped up in this big battle between good and evil. We have another Pilgrim's Progress line uh, talking about uh, the foe and the perils that beset him at every hand, that beset Christian at every hand. Helen uses that at the beginning of chapter 37, talking about little Arthur, and that if she left, she would have to leave Arthur behind. And if she did that, he would be basically left in the midst of uh, a bunch of really bad actors. And that would not be so good for her little boy, who completely understandably is drawn to goofy fun that he's having with his dad. And then, you know, his mom gets more and more serious as dad gets more and more outrageous. And what kid wants to hang out with seriousness? And suddenly we see Helen as her aunt in pretty much exactly the same situation. The difference being that her uncle, who, as, as was stated, at least did go and check into Huntington's finances and did his due diligence. As far as that goes, her uncle, of course, was no Huntington and was at least a, a conscientious parent, in loco parentis parent, whereas her father, you know, whatever. <sniffs> we don't hear much about him. So we have, we have all of the Pilgrim's Progress stuff going on in 37, but let's go back to 34. When Helen and Arabella are going through their Cold War, and Helen, as the, the lady of the house, gets to have kind of the upper hand in several situations because of that, she, she mentions her malevolent gratification. And I thought that was a brilliant description of what it can feel like when you get to be righteously angry about something or something that someone else did, and you know you're in the right, and you know that the other person knows that you're in the right, and it feels really good. And part of the reason it feels really good is because most of the time you're probably losing, and you'll probably go on to lose more as it goes on. But that moment of malevolent gratification is so human. And, you know, she pulls away from it, sure. She recognizes, yeah, this is probably not such a great way to be right now. It's not going to be very helpful. But Anne Bronte is honest enough with herself and with us and with Helen to allow Helen, someone who is always striving to do better, be better, and reads her Bible and pays attention to these things, it still doesn't mean that she's not going to have that moment. And it also doesn't mean that she's going to beat herself up for having that moment. It's okay. It's human. It's what you do next that's going to matter. But we get it. And it just humanizes Helen that much more. Then there was in 35, the go and sin no more moment with Hargrave, where he's all, oh, I have offended you. I can't live with myself if I've offended you. And, you know, he's just trying to hook up with her. And she knows it. And he's being a little overwrought. And so when she turns, when she turns and says, go, you know, I, I can't live with myself if I've offended you. Fine, go and sin no more. <laughs> Just leave me out of it, son. And he's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And truly, putting Jesus's words to an adulterous woman into the mouth of Helen talking to a guy who seems to be trying to lure her into adultery. It's just brilliant. It's a beautiful moment. In 36, I had mentioned that there were some really good descriptions of what it feels like to be in an abusive relationship and the kinds of things, or an abusive situation, the kinds of things that one winds up. I don't know if you have to do it, but people certainly wind up doing it to themselves. Uh, she talked about congealing and turning to stone. And she speaks about it right before the scene with uh, Huntington showing her Annabella's 
letter and says, let this instruct you. And I thought she handled it marvelously because he thought he was going to, I don't know, provoke her, drive her to tears, whatever, get a rise out of her somehow. And the word that Anne Bronte uses is he tittered when he gave her the letter. I mean, that is such a man baby description. He's just, he's sitting there tittering. Like, hee, 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 hee. Look what I'm doing to her. Hee, hee. What a snot. Uh, gah. The sad thing is, I've known people like that. I'm sure you have too. And it's just pathetic. And Helen is doing a much better job of doing the, you're just pathetic thing. Oh, here, let me show you Annabella's letter so you can take some instruction on how to be a woman. Yeah, thank you. I will take instruction from it on how not to be a woman. Thank you very much. But yeah, Huntingdon, the, um... the interesting thing is that everybody does have an arc in the story, all of the main characters, which you might not be expecting right now. But I will tell you, Huntingdon, Huntingdon continues to get interesting. He is not just a drunken man baby the whole time. I mean, he is, but he also gets more interesting. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's more of an indictment <laughs> than praise anyway. I'm not sure. You'll have to decide as we get there. Uh, but the key to Helen, the most important part, I think, is in chapter 37, when she is asked, wouldn't you like to have revenge on Arthur Huntingdon for what he's done to you? And her response, her honest response what good would revenge do? What good would it do? It would make him no better and me no happier. That is such wisdom. There's, I mean, there's all the famous lines, revenge is a dish best served cold and all of that kind of stuff. Sure. And that's Wuthering Heights. And Jane Eyre might be revenge. Oh no, I would never think of such a thing. That would be wrong. Wrong is too easy. It's too pat. It's too simplified. Helen saying, revenge wouldn't do me any good. It wouldn't help him, which has been her whole goal all the way along, from even from before they were married. And it wouldn't help me either, because he wouldn't feel any better. And it wouldn't have solved the problem. And how can you feel better if you haven't solved the problem? And the problem, of course, at this point, isn't just that her husband is behaving like a man baby. Her problem is that her husband is going to wind up drinking himself to death, or at least into pretty serious sickness. And there just aren't medical options available that can swoop in and help out. You really can drink yourself to death. And if he's involved in heavier things than just drinking, then it's that much more dangerous. And I thought that was an excellent place to end. So there we are. End of volume two, beginning of volume three. I will leave you there until next week, where we will pick up volume three and continue seeing uh, how Helen keeps getting better and hopefully how our world will keep getting better too, I hope. You take care of yourself, wear a mask, wash your hands, be kind to each other. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review over at iTunes. Join us on Facebook. Meet up with the knitters on Craftlet's Corner of Ravelry. Stay in the know on Instagram or add your name to our mailing list, which I promise will never spam you. In fact, you probably want to buy a lottery ticket on any day that you get a message from the Craftlet mailing list because that'll be a special day. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>